28. Um, I'd like to start from Matthew 28 because something, something very interesting happened in Matthew 28. Um, and I'd like us to have the right gravity behind what happened in Matthew 28. Um, God forbid that something like that happens. But if anybody here that you know very well, somebody that you know very well, you've seen around for the last three years, four years, suddenly dies, I'm sure many of us will not be happy. Now, I'm sure if the person that dies after you've known him for three years, four years, you suddenly hear news that the person is now alive, I'm sure you will be pleasantly surprised. If the person printed a poster and told you that he or she was organizing an event, I'm certain you will attend. I will together. Now, you knew him for three and a half years, four years, he died or she died, and then you heard again that the person rose again, and then he's organizing an event. I'm sure we'll pack this hall full. You know, out of curiosity to hear what will this person talk about. And then you come to this person and this person says, I am here for only 40 days. And in those 40 days, I want to re-emphasize what is gravely important to me. I have tried to explain myself to you over the last three and a half years. But in case you don't get it, this is the assignment I have for you. So, and the person in this case was Jesus Christ. He died. His disciples weren't expecting him to die. He had told them he was going to die. They didn't believe it. He had told them the Son of Man will have his... The Bible says all of those things became clear after he rose again. So all of those things were coded to them even though he had told them. You know, sometimes I wonder, didn't the devil hear that he said he was going to die? You know, but even the devil didn't understand it. It was coded to him. Until he had died and risen again before they understood, wow, you know, we've just been... We've just, you know, gotten messed up. So Jesus Christ came back after three and a half years... I think every word he said before then was important. I think every word he said after then is even more grave. Now, I need to pay attention and say, okay, if he went and he came back again for 40 days, he could have gone straight away, but he still stayed around to educate, enlighten, then it must be very important. Good. So, he rose. 28 was the story of his resurrection. I'd like us to go to that place we read very frequently. Verse 18. Yeah? Verse 18 Jesus Christ, written in red, in the Bible I'm reading here, somebody says the reason why Jesus Christ's words are written in red is because they are meant to be read. Okay? So, it's red, so you, please read it. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 18. It says, And Jesus Christ came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ comes and says, you know, before, I, I didn't have all the authority in heaven and on earth. Now, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, but I'm not going to be here to use it. Okay? I'm going to leave you here. This is my last statement before I, before I go. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then somebody said, Amen. Okay, I know somebody said Amen because the Amen is in black. Yeah? <laughs> in this Bible, it says Amen. <laughs> yeah, so somebody said Amen. Say, so, yeah, I agree. Now, why am I saying this? Jesus Christ came, and I think this is very serious. I'd like to read it to us in another version. I have a message translation here. Uh, message is a bit more contemporary, present-day language. So I'd like to see it from that angle and listen to what it says. It says, Jesus, undeterred, went ahead and gave this charge. He says, God authorized me and commanded me to commission you. Are we together? Can you look at your neighbor and say you are commissioned? Yes, this is your neighbor. Jesus commissioned you as God authorized him. Now, what's the commissioning? He says, go out and train everyone you meet. Are we together? He says, go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life. Are we together? He said, go and teach everyone, not somebody, not a few people, everyone you meet in this way of life. Now, understand this. I think we have a fundamental problem in society if it's difficult to identify 
the difference between the people that are following Jesus and the people that are not. If the things, if you look at somebody, you look at the way he behaves, and you cannot decipher that this one is following Jesus Christ. And I'm saying following Jesus Christ because I don't want to use the word Christian because he gets me a bit scared. You look at the person and this person is following Jesus Christ, you must be able to tell by their way of life. That means there's a way of life that comes with following Jesus Christ. He says, train everyone that you meet in this way of life. Are we together? Now, I says, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Now, you and I have a commissioning from God. I like the way Jesus Christ said it. He said, God authorized me to commission you. He says in KJV, all authority in heaven and on earth is now given to me. I am now about to bestow responsibility on you. And that responsibility is simple. Now, when you say disciple all the nations, in current day English, I need to understand what disciple means. I need to understand the root word behind that disciple word to understand what he asked me to do. In very simple terms, he's ensure that everybody you meet along the way, you train them in a particular way of life. There's a way of life that characterizes people that follow God. Uh, the first set of Christians were called Christians in Antioch. Acts 11.26. They looked at them and they saw their way of life and they said, look, we need to find a name for this. You don't understand. Now, Jesus Christ is not familiar with that word Christian. Yeah? He's familiar with the word disciple. He called them disciples. Now, the Bible says the disciples were called Christians for the first time. That means whenever you see the word disciple, if I want to understand what the people are saying, I should be able to say he's talking about Christians. And Jesus Christ said, except you are willing to hate your father, hate your mother, die to yourself, you can't even be a Christian. Are we together? Now, there's a standard that God expects from us. There's a way of life that the world must see us and be able to say, ah, this person is behaving in a particular way. He must be a follower of Jesus Christ. He must be a Christian. Now, why did I lay that foundation to say? I lay that foundation to say, today by God's grace, in the next few minutes, I want to teach us about a particular way of life. A way of life defined in God's word about how we're supposed to run a dimension of our lives. Jesus Christ says, everyone you meet, train them in this way of life. Everyone. You know, somebody sent me a mail this morning. I left Lagos this morning around 8 o'clock. I saw his mail around 6 a.m. Now, I met with him yesterday, and for the first time, I realized he's not a Christian. He told me I'd never heard his religion before, until, day before, until yesterday. Um, and I'm sure many people here might not know it. It's, it's probably popular in the East. He believes to a religious persuasion that believes we all worship the same God, and we all need to accept each other. Period. I we together. And then he sends me a mail this morning and says, Sir, I'd like to say to you that every time I think about the day I met you, I know that God did something in my life. Um, every morning I think about this, I see this, I see this, I see this, and I'm just sending this mail to you so that you can guide me. You are my mentor, you are my leader, guide me. And I, I to, when, I, when he told me his persuasion yesterday, I told him, you know what, we need to see. Let's sit down together. Bring forth your strong reasons. Let me, let's reason together. I don't think you can be doing this to yourself. You need to understand better because the reason why you're doing what you're doing is because you don't know. And then we talk and he sends me a mail and says, guide me. I have this decision in my life I want to take. I need your guidance. Now what's going on? What's going on is, Jesus Christ says, everyone you meet, train them in this way of life. Now he's getting to see, okay, there's a way of life here that I want to learn. Um, I, I have my beliefs before I met you but I feel there's something superior here I want to learn. And gradually, we'll have the conversation. I, I, the end I see for him is that he'll follow Jesus. Are we together? Now, but understand this. We are expected by Jesus to ensure that there's power available in heaven and on earth to ensure that everyone we meet is trained in line with his way of life. Now, there are many things we need to learn about Jesus' way of life. Uh, the kingdom way of life. What I want to share... One key element today in line with the thrust of what I do um, as, a, as an entry point into many places. Matthew 25. 
that as you listen to what I'm sharing with you, there are three responsibilities that I'm transferring to you. One, the responsibility to understand and learn this way of life. Two, the responsibility to train everybody you meet along this way of life. Three, the responsibility to do, to act in line with what the Bible says and to embrace this way of life. Are we together? Yes. Now, that the moment you realize that everything Jesus Christ said from Matthew 1 to, Jude, to, to Luke to Mark to John, he wasn't saying it to them so that they would understand it. He was saying it to them with the benefit of hindsight to ensure that as soon as he was gone, they can go ahead and teach it. All together. Now, that the moment you realize that Jesus Christ didn't speak to them just for their own consumption, but he would tell them to instruct others, they couldn't afford to be learning like students. I would together. So tonight, over the next few minutes, I would like you to take on the paradigm of a teacher. I would together. Uh, one of the things I learned in my university days is that you will learn, I learned it practically, you learn a lot more when you are listening like you want to teach somebody else. I would together. When you are listening like, okay, Explain it to me so that I can explain to somebody else. You learn a lot more. I was trying to explain something to someone about two days ago. And the person said to me, wow, I never saw that before. And I said, I've explained it to you at least four times. The reason why you see it now is because there's somebody who has asked you a question that you want to go and answer. You want to teach somebody. That's why now you are seeing it for the first time. That there are things you will learn until you position yourself in the capacity to train others, you will never truly assimilate. Um, I had courses, I had no business understanding. But because when I listen to the courses I'm right, there are 200 people that depend on me to learn this. They want me to know this so that I can teach them. So I have to learn it. So listen with the perspective of being able to teach other people. Now, if you're here and you're doing business, you do any kind of business, uh, I interacted with somebody a bit, I hear that people learn you know, to create multiple sources of income, in this house. If you're here and you fall in that category, can I see your hand? You do any kind of business, you're earning income in multiple streams. Okay? You are here, you don't fall into that category, but you desire to. Can I see your hand? You don't fall in that category, you desire to. Okay? Um, you are here, you don't fall into that category, and you don't desire to. Can I see your hand as well? Okay? You don't fall into the category, you don't desire to. Let me see your hand. It's, it's fine. You know, I had a training this morning where I asked people, if you are here and you are selling nothing, can I see your hand? And I saw about 50% of the class, the use of their hand, they sell nothing. So I spent the first five minutes convincing them that they sell something. So I can ask them again. I said, okay, we all sell something. <laughs> Matthew 25. Okay. Uh, once I'm on half time, I would like a, sing, a signal because I'd like you to ask me questions. I'd like you to ask me what you don't understand so that I can, I can help you uh, I can answer those questions. Um, I Sometimes I wonder, you know, where do I begin to introduce myself from? Um, so I, I try to avoid it. Um, I'm a bit confused about who I am fully. I follow Jesus passionately. I'm interested in the development of a new Nigeria. I am passionate about the possibility of that change. Um, I like training everybody I meet along the way, on the way of life I've learned. Um, I'm a business person as well. I'm an entrepreneur. I believe that uh, business provides an opportunity to empower people. Um, so if you have any questions in those directions, I'm a pastor as well. So I'm a pastor and a child of God. Uh, I'm following Jesus Christ. Matthew 25 from verse 14. Now, I, I gave them a slide. I don't know if they'll be able to show it, but if they don't show it, not the problem. The title is How to Get Capital to Start Your Business. How to Get Capital to Start or Increase Your Business. How God's way, God's, God's approved way or God's way of getting capital to start whatever it is you want to start. I, I see people everywhere, people stumped to do what they really want to do by virtue of the limitations they think that they have. And I see here a kingdom principle of how we are meant to organize our lives. Now, this is a... We're going to read a few verses together. I'll take it line by line, precept by one precept. I'll explain for about 30 minutes, and then I'll pause. And if you have questions, you can ask me. Verse 14 says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man. Okay? I want to open it here as well, so that I can have it in two translations. My normal Bible has...
KJV and message on one side. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. Can you say with me, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling on a far journey. Try traveling to a far country. Now, it begins this story to explain how the kingdom of heaven operates. How our way of life should be in dimensions of our lives. If you read earlier from verse 1, he says the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. So there's a lot, of, a lot going on here. I'm trying to define the way of life of a group of people who belong to a domain called heaven. Yeah? And it says the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling the far journey. Uh, I'd like to refer briefly to the first parable before there where he defines the concept of what you call wisdom and foolishness. In verse 2 he says, five of them were wise and five were foolish. So in describing the kingdom of heaven, he says you are likely to find two different ways in which people will manage their lives. Some will be wise and some will be foolish. Are we together? Now, what defines the wise? Everywhere you look at the word wise in the scripture, you will find something interesting. Wisdom is not defined as the capacity to pass exams. It's not defined by intellectual prowess. It's not defined by vocabulary. It's not defined by ability to process things logically. Wisdom is the behavior that somebody manifests when they are thinking long term. Yeah? Wisdom is the manifestation of long term thinking. Wisdom is the way you will behave if you are not thinking for a short while. When the Bible says, go to the hands, you slug God, consider his ways, what defines the wisdom of the ants is the fact that the ants is thinking that a time will come when things will not be the way they are today. Are we together? When he says five virgins were foolish and five were wise, he's saying some will carry surplus oil because they feel it will take a longer time than we're expecting for the bridegroom to come. So wisdom is what you manifest when your eyes are set on a longer term. So the longer term, the, the more your vision is on eternity, the wiser you are likely to be. Are we together? That anybody who is not thinking about life after now is already classified as foolish. Are we together? And a fool says in his heart there is no God. Because a fool is not thinking there is a judgment day. A fool is not thinking, when I die, what next? A fool's life is bound by 90 years. It's like a football match. 45 years first half, 45 years second half. And then if he doesn't achieve anything, there is extra time. And if still nothing, there is penalty shootout. Are we together? Now, so wisdom here is being defined and he explains how the kingdom of heaven operates and says, this is what will happen. This is the terminologies. But these are the things you need to understand for how people prepare themselves for the coming of the Son of Man. Well, let's go again to 25. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Okay, we're going to learn a few key principles here. I like to talk about the things that need to shift in our thinking. More often than not, the average person is looking for short-term solutions to their problems. So the leaf of the tree is green and the average person says, how do I make these leaves continue to be green? After a while, the leaves become brown or yellow and the person says, what do I do? He paints it. So let me paint it green. Something is wrong with these leaves. God, give me a miracle. Let my leaves be green. And we're focused on those leaves green. So he paints it green and he gives a testimony. And then it stays green for about two weeks. And then the rain falls, washes away the green, and it's back to yellow. Now, the yellow is, sh- is thicker than the previous yellow. Because while he was really doing nothing, the real leaf was getting yellow in color. And then he says, God, this is getting from bad to worse. So he looks for thicker paint. Paints all the leaves, and anybody passes by, sees the trees, and wow, something good is happening here. But the real leaf underneath is now becoming brown and hard. Flaking away and dying. That more often than not, we attack, we attack the leaves where what we need to do is cure the roots. Allow there to be water in the roots. Allow the fundamental things to be done. Now, the first thing that is a root here that you and I need to identify is that in God's kingdom, every servant who got something was given. I go together. Everything that you have everything that you will use, everything that will help you to achieve God's purpose on the earth, 
that will allow you to do whatever business you want to do was given. The first thing we need to understand is that every resource we have is a stewardship. Are we together? I own nothing. You know, sometimes I listen to people talk about the topic of what should I give to God? God owns everything. God owns you. God owns everything you have. What you should ask from God is what should I keep for myself? Are we together? That every resource they had, they were given. I'll explain it to you from two sides. I was having a conversation with somebody four days ago. And I have many conversations with different people because of the way my life is. I meet with people and I train everybody I meet along the way. So I was having a conversation with this person. All his hair white. And he's in his late years. And he was saying to me, Deolu, I haven't achieved anything. I haven't achieved anything. And I have some resources. The resources I have I estimated the value of the resources he has. It's over 500 million naira. But he despises them. You know why he despises them? Because it was an inheritance. He says, I, I want to do something for myself. How, how can I be living my life based on what my father gave me? And I said, sir, even if your father didn't give you, what do you have that you are not given? Are we together? Yeah. Now, so on one side, some people despise what they have because they feel I was given. And on the other side, some people love what they have because, because they think my own hand brought me this. Okay, I'm here to say to you, whatever side you fall on, whatever you have was given. Are we together? The resources that you operate with, if you understand the way the kingdom of heaven operates and the people that are there, our way of life is understanding that every resource we have was given. It may not be cash. I may think what I used to get the cash is my business acumen. Ladies and gentlemen, the business acumen was given. Are we together? You may think the reason why I got what I got is because I was positioned. Whatever position you find yourself in was given. I was together. You may say, well, I did, my father didn't give me anything. But everywhere I went and I mentioned my son name, people looked at me different. I was together. It was given. Now, that in God's kingdom, you want to operate, understand that everything you will run with was given. Now, it, it keeps you humble. And it keeps you in the right posture with God for God to be able to reach out to you and help you. You do not have anything. Are we together? And let me drive it home for you a little bit. I asked a question in church one day. I said, sir, if I came here today and I said, this is offering money. Are we together? So that you can see it spiritually. This is offering money. One million. Take it. Go and do business with it. And come and pay God back. What kind of business will you do with it? If the business you will do with it is different from the one you are doing today, you should stop the business you are doing today. Because even though what you got was not offering money, you need to see it that way. It's God's money. Are we together? That's the perspective. That everything you are engaging in, you need to ask yourself, God gave this money to me. Am I spending it correctly? Ah, someone said, if it was God's money, it must never get lost. I will pay more attention. I will work harder. I will do this. I will do that. I'm going to say, what are you doing today? So today you are spending the devil's money. Are we together? <laughs> so, first key paradigm I like you to shift, and it's a major shift, is we are stewards. That's what we are. The Bible says he was traveling on a far country. The person who was traveling on a con- far country there is God. Yeah? And he gave them resources. He gave goods to them. So you're a steward. And you need to carry that mind frame into what you're doing. Somebody said, ah, if God, someone was very funny. He said, if you give me money like that and I'm supposed to deliver interest next week, I will go and sell bread. That all of a sudden, selling bread did not become the meaning anymore. Because God's money will not be returned exactly the way he left. Because you understand that the guy here who kept it constant was chastised. Do you understand? So he says, I will go and buy bread and I will sell bread. Because it's God's money. And I'm really. So what have you been doing? I've been posing around town doing nothing. So you can sell bread. So number one, stewardship. Number two. He says he delivered his goods to them. It means 
there is nobody that doesn't have something. Now, and I see people around who tell you, I don't have capital. Or, I don't have what it takes. Somebody came to meet me some weeks back. He said, Diolu, I'm tired of my job. I want to leave, but I'm afraid. I said, why are you afraid? He said, I'm afraid because I'm asking myself, what will I live on? I have these ideas. I have things I want to do. I, I can do them. Because in the company I used to work for, I was the one responsible for doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, doing that. My only problem now is what will happen to me as I don't have, I've not built a war chest to sustain me in this time. And I said to him, if you let go of where you are, what you will need is not capital. What you will need is relationships. What you need is people. Because what you need in those seasons of your life are people who can help you to make it bearable. The shortest distance usually between any two places is the company you are in. <laughs> are we together? Somebody said to me, ah, how long is this from that place to the airport? I said, it's one hour. He said, really? The last time I went there, I didn't notice. I said, yes, you were in good company. You were talking throughout the time. You didn't know that it took one hour to get there. Try going alone. You will experience the real time. Okay, but everybody has something. Usually what we need is the right relationship that covers for what we lack. You know, I, tell, I, say, I share this with people. If you read Genesis, you realize God did not make man as an independent entity. You are not meant to achieve your highest alone. When God wanted to make man, he stepped out of individuality into community. He said, let us make man in our image. Man was made with an understanding that he will operate collectively. You don't understand? He says, and let them have dominion, let them multiply, let them be fruitful. Not let him. Your highest will not be achieved alone. You are designed to have what you will not have. You will never be perfect alone. Are we together? There will be a, no matter how brilliant and exceptional you are, you will have blind spots. Are we together? No matter how kitted you are in front, somebody needs to watch your back. Are we together? So you need to realize that I will need people. So all I need is not, it's not I'm not, ah, if I can get this, no. Many of us fall into the trap of thinking, I can't do this because I don't have this skill. You don't need that skill. You need somebody that needs, has a skill. Many people do businesses that they only know how to do. They become technical, self-employed people. Because I do, I'm doing the business I can do. I'm a doctor. I don't have to give injection. So you give injection 24-7. You stay there. Somebody rings you at 1 a.m., you run there. The day you begin to become sharp is the day you realize... I can become an administrator here and employ 20 other doctors. I can look for where I will stand, find people who love to do this, run a shift, and take my eyes off the painstaking, self-employed, 24-7 kind of approach. What you need is not extra resource. What you need is people. All the resource, everybody has something. Everybody has something. Can you look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor you have something? It's your responsibility to discover what you have. You need to discover what you have. The first process in the development of any economy is identification of resource. There's no country that doesn't have anything. There's no individual that doesn't have something. When in your forward rocky community is discovered, is it community? <laughs> in your forward rocky, I'm sure you know where it is. <laughs> in your forward rocky, somewhere in Osho State. When you go to in your forward rocky, in your forward, it begins to develop as an economy by first of all identifying what resource do we have. Are we together? Now, what, what is being analyzed there is a very strong economic policy of how this kingdom will operate. Anybody who wants to deal with resource, with development, with those things in those directions needs to understand how the kingdom of heaven operates. The first place for any economy's development is identifying what resource do we have. Unfortunately, some of us never leave that place. Okay, my prayer is that we will leave that place in Jesus' name. I'm not praying for you alone. I'm praying for Nigeria as well. We live the place where what we are surrounded by and what we are spending our time on is the resource that we have. Everybody has something. The perspective you need to operate with is the perspective of I have. 
is now a matter of discovery. Are we together? It's a matter of discovery. How many of you have looked around you, you have seen people who don't have your skill, they don't have your qualification, they don't have your expertise, they don't have your intelligence, but it looks as if life is favorable to them. Are we together? What it's telling, what it's telling you is, it's not about what you don't have. It's about what you have, you have not discovered. Okay? He gave every one of them something. He says, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately, he went on a journey. Okay, good. Two things we'll pick from that. Everybody has something. Are we together? Nobody here is at the starting point. If you are at the starting point, I'll be hearing where from you. But we are way beyond our starting point. It means you have added other things that you are not given at the beginning. Like an education. Are we together? Everybody was given something. Understand this. Everybody was given something according to their ability. Now, sounds interesting. Let's look at it. It means where you are today, what you have today, is a definition of heaven's understanding of your ability. I'll let you understand it. Where you are today, sir, eh? is based on what you deserve to have based on what God understands your ability to be. If you want more than what you have today, it's very simple. Increase your ability. Are we together? That, ah, I wish I was like that. Ah, this person is just favored. Where you are, is heaven's measure of your ability. Now, if where you are is heaven's measure of your ability, if you give them according to their ability, you ask yourself, how did you know their ability? What ability? Exactly. What, ex- what ability? Because if I know that where I am is a function of how heaven rates my ability, then I need to increase my ability. And if I want to increase my ability, I need to know what ability is. Are we together? If I don't know what ability is, I will keep on performing at the same level of ability. I will keep on staying exactly where I am. You know, many of us, we, we don't pray it out loud. I hope you don't. Because it doesn't make sense to pray it. But somewhere in our hearts, in the dark places of our hearts, we wish for more. You know, there was a song we sang, Jesus, more, more, more of you. Yeah? We want more. And we don't realize that more requires more. Are we together? That if you want more, something needs to happen on your own inside that is more as well. Now, if I realize that, and listen, I tell people in my seminars, I tell people, say this after me. Where I am today is my fault. I would say, I would together. Can you tell your neighbor where you are today? It's your fault. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where you are going. It's your choice. Now, <laughs> now listen. The, for as long as you can blame somebody else for your failure, you will not be successful. Because becoming successful requires taking responsibility for your failure. Then you can be responsible for your success. Whoever you are blaming for your failure will also take the glory for your success. Are we together? Because really it lies in their hand. They are the ones that did it to me. There's a poster I see in Portacot everywhere I'm going. Every time I go to Portacot, who did this to you? Poster has been there for a few years. And I'm wondering, really, <laughs> are they still doing it to you? Okay, whenever you see that poster, please say, I did it to me. You know, there's a company I like to talk about. It's a company that did something very interesting. He told, he put a signboard outside and said, the person that has been limiting you in this company and dragging you back is now dead. Funeral service holds at Gold Hall. So everybody was wondering, ah, is he the HR manager? Is he the head of finance? They were asking, is HR manager dead? Say he's still alive. Say, ah. So who is responsible? He says, in the conference room. So they go to the conference room, they saw a coffin in front, everybody dressed, looking sad, MD there, HR director there, finance director there, everybody's wondering who is missing. 
And then one by one, they go to the front to, you know, pay their last obeisance and see the coffin. And they get there and they look at the coffin and they say, hey, uh, you know, and of course, what's inside the coffin is a mirror. So they just look at themselves. This is the person limiting you. <laughs> it's no more. <laughs> The only person authorized to limit you is you. Yeah? And we limit ourselves by even the way we think about ourselves. And now understand this. God gave them according to their ability. So what is ability? Now, if I tell you what ability is, you should ask me, how did I find out what ability is? Because if it's going to be ability, I need to see it in scripture. Yeah? Now, did God give them according to their ability? Yes. Did their master give them according to their ability? But we are not told what ability is. Were we? No. But guess what? If you read to the end, you realize some people now got more. It meant at the time they were getting more, they had done something that had elevated their ability. So if you want to find ability, it's a mathematical equation. If you want to find ability, find what they did. Are we together? It's very simple. If you want to know the known, check the known, check the known, separate the known together, to one side, and then the unknown will pop out. Good. So, he gave them according to their ability. And then, he came back after and said, you that had ten, take more. That means ability had increased. What did the one who had five manifest that showed increased ability? Are we together? Number one, I can see a number of abilities there, but I identify a few for you. Number one was accountability. He was able to give account of how he had done what he had done. I we together. He said he told him how he had five and how he had achieved more. He said he showed him. He showed the master. If you look at verse 19, since after a long time, the lot of those servants came and settled accounts with them. He meant he had been keeping accounts. He says the one who had received five talents came, brought five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. I have gained five more. And he says, good and faithful servant, did, did, did. he give account. So one of the abilities here is accountability. Now, many of us have, for the last five years of our lives, lived lives that we cannot account for. The resources have passed through our hands. We cannot tell where he went. Are we together? Am I, listen, it's okay for you to be able to stay today and judge your past and ensure that your future doesn't look like it. Okay, so it's not a message of let's condemn our past. What do I do next? Accountability. He took account. Give account. Many of us don't even know. Somebody said to me, he said, ah. He said, I've been working now for 25 years. And I just looked at my life and realized I don't have anything. I hear that story frequently. I have nothing. I have nothing to show for it. Somebody said to me, he said, Diolu, for 20 years in the company I worked, I was the best in sales. Best. I made records, I beat records, I made money. When I look at my life now, I've not done anything. Somebody saw me in Portacot last week. I was in Portacot last week. He said, Dude, as you were talking, I realized something. The only thing I have to show for all my years of labor is a duplex. And that duplex, you know the problem with it? When you are talking, I realized the problem with that duplex. I realized that that duplex was a mistake. I said, why? He said, that duplex is in the village. <laughs> because when he was talking to me, you know, I, I was already advising him. He said, I have a duplex. I said, guy, guy, guys, never late. Partition the duplex into four. Stay in one corner. Rent out the rest. He said, my brother, my brother, it's in the village. I said, it is post Biafra philosophy. It is not this way of life. You know, so he said to me, Diolu, I'll keep in touch. You know, I, I need to reorganize my life. Many people need to reorganize their life, and they're already 55. But there's still hope. There's still life. Okay? You can still live up to 120. As we progress in time, until Jesus comes, people will live longer. Yeah, we're getting there. So one of the abilities is accountability. And I, I don't have time to talk about those things very much. So I'm just hinting the topics. 
Um, but you need to begin to become accountable. You need to begin to become accountable. Accountable for the resources that he gave you. Because he gave you. If, I, if you are giving offering money, take that picture, one million. Will you see, will you just be going along the road and see sweet? Say, ah. And I want to lick sweet oh. Please bring me. You, as in sanctified common sense. <laughs> will tell you God is involved though. For the money you have in your hand, God is involved. Yeah. Okay? I tell people, ah, it's not enough time. I was sharing with some people somewhere. I asked the question. I said, you are going on a journey. Transportation required for that journey is 2,000 naira. Going, 1,000. Coming back, 1,000. And you have 2,000 naira in your pocket. And somebody beside you cries and sees you and says, my brother, my brother, I just realized that my pocket is leaking. I don't have money for this transport that we are inside. Meet me. Please borrow me one. Give me one thousand, so that I can pay the conductor. I ask, will you give him? Eh? <laughs> 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 huh? Will you give him? Where you are going? There is nobody that is going to give you money there. You have 2,000 naira. You are just going and to come back. Will you give him? Are you wicked? <laughs> Why did you give him? Listen. The only money that leaves your hand without much thought is the one you don't have purpose for. Are we together? Now, the reason why he's not going to release it is because I've already defined purpose for that money. Now, every time you are spending without much thinking, without planning, is because that money is purposeless. You didn't sit down to say, God has given me this resource. What do I want to do with it? What's the purpose? What do I want to achieve with it? But guess what? Many of us don't even think about it. We simply feel that we're being nice. Settle with the person and then we become beggars. Am I, am I, am I communicating? I've seen it all the time. Somebody came to meet me. He said, you know, when you, were, when you, you, you taught me not to, to do this, and I, but somebody came and he had a problem. And I have to be a good person. So I helped him out. I said, congratulations, well done. He said, but now me, I have a problem. <laughs> Come and help me. Aha. I told him, he said, look, one rich man in the company of four poor men is a fifth poor man in disguise. Very soon. He will join them to go and beg to help them out. To help them out. If you can't educate your friends, you'll soon join your friends. So, the first ability that you see, accountability. All of us need to learn to account for what comes into our hands. Go together. The other ability I can see there is multiply ability. Go together. You can see that. He multiplied it. And then he got more. Multiply ability. The capacity to ensure that one thing was given to you and you added value to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I worry when somebody tells you based on his business plan that he has developed the startup capital he needs for his business is 10 million naira. And you ask him, how much do you have? He said, my brother, I have idea. I have the idea. And the idea is all I have. But where I want to start from in life is from the top of a skyscraper. And from there on, I'll begin to dig down. And that's a grave. Because you need to learn how to multiply one before you can get ten. And the way it operates, God's kingdom and, and life is wide along those dimensions already if man will not corrupt it. I tell people, if, I, if you ask me, bros, bros, borrow me 5,000. I'm stranded. And I give him 5,000 naira. And then the next day he comes back and says, my brother, thank you. 
here's the 5,000 naira back. But because as a principle, nothing comes to my hand and goes back the same. When I was coming, I saw some oranges. Please help me manage these oranges. Are we together? Yeah. Good. And then we go. And then a month from now, he says to me, my brother, I need 20,000 naira. Please. I need to do something. Do you think I'll give him? <laughs> Definitely. I'll give 20,000 naira. He comes back. He gives me back 20,000 naira. And he says, sir, I don't want it to come. I know you didn't give me with interest. But I added something to it. So I counted the money I saw 21,000 naira. If he has a business plan for 200,000 naira, 300,000 naira, he can talk to me. He has built credibility. I tell people credibility is your ability to collect credit. <laughs> and it is consciously built. You build the credibility. Somebody else comes to me and says, Bros, bros, I need 100,000. That's where it started from. <laughs> I need 100,000. In the past, when my money did not have purpose, I will be moved in my bowels of... I will think it's compassion that's moving me. I will, know it's, I will not know it's not purposelessness. In the current days, I'll say, hmm, you want 100,000? I have somebody who works with me, whose responsibility is to respond to those kind of demands. Go and see him. And then when you see him, very professional, very professional guy. He has not plenty of emotions. <laughs> say, how much do you need? Say, 100,000. Say, okay. What's the business? Say, this is, this is okay. Where's your collateral? Ah. Are you back? <laughs> Build credibility. Now, um, somebody borrowed, somebody collected 20,000 naira from me one day. He said, please help me, help me. I gave it to him. And guess what? He didn't return it. Do you know what? I'm happy for him. He has gotten his inheritance. <laughs> because I had the capacity to borrow him 2 million. But when he said 20,000 naira, I was very happy. I gave it to him, believing that I can see his credibility. I went to a particular country. I had opened an account in the country for a few years. And then I was there at the bank and I wanted to get a loan. And they said to me, Deolu, because you had not been borrowing and returning, you have no credibility with us. You don't understand. I have money in the account. It's a well-funded account. But my credibility is not a function of that I have money there. I need to show that I can collect, return, collect, return, collect, return. That's how credibility is grown. So, he said, look, if you want to get money, you can, you can give you 100%. But begin to use it. It's there. Start small. Continue. After you use it for a while, then we realize, ah, this person is a sure banker. He has a good name. He doesn't want to spoil it. I was talking to one of my mentors recently and he said to me, I have borrowed two billion from the bank before I have never used any collateral. All I've ever used to collect money from the bank, Nigerian bank, is my name. They call it on personal, they call it personal guarantee. Personal guarantee. That this person can't run anywhere. He has built a good name. It will be your turn. So, <laughs> accountability, multipliability. Add value to whatever they give you. Add value to it. Don't expect and wait for it to be big. Start small. Start small. Add value. Everything that becomes big, start small. Are we together? So, start small and multiply. Number three, ability. I've said credibility, yeah? You can put that as number three. Number four, ability is risk. Call it riskability or risk taking ability. How do I know that counts? Because the last person who didn't do anything decided to play it safe. Are we together? Let me read it to you here. Verse 24. The servant given 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards and hate careless ways. That you demand the best and make no allowance for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you. 
So I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is safe and sound to the last cent. 26. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. Tell your neighbor, it is criminal to live cautiously like that. Some of us are too careful. To uh, say, ah, I don't want to lose it though. I prefer not to go and lose it. Are we together? You will not succeed until you fail. Are we together? How many of you were learning how to drive and the first day, manual, you drove the car and it was smooth? Can I see your hand so that I can know who to pray for? <laughs> manual. And it was very smooth. Ah, you've been driving for years. No, you, you jack. You start rough. Are we together? Same thing with business. Same thing with anything you want to do. You learn. You think preaching is a gift. The first time you try it, you realize it. <laughs> you, are we together? You realize that it gets better the second time. And then it's all time. Even if what they give you is a gift, you still need to learn how to use it. So, risk taking ability. Two risks with them. Do you know why I realized also a risk? It's possible that the person with five talents, if the master had come at the wrong time, the talents would be in inventory. Or you would have lost it. But you realize that you keep at it. There will be down times. There will be low times. And then you bounce back if you don't stop. So there's accountability, there's credibility, there's multiplying ability, there's risk-taking ability. And those were the key abilities that they functioned in. So first of all, it's a stewardship. Second of all, everybody has a resource. And third of all, it is given based on ability. And when the master came to settle accounts with them, they went to trade with what they had. And I tell people as well, listen, um, you need to learn how to trade value. Everybody has value. But your value in your hands doesn't mean anything. You need to learn to serve. You need to learn to offer the value somewhere else. I tell people, experience. You know, experience is what they look for in, in working places. Experience is not experience because you are paid to do it. Experience is experience because you did it. What counts is that you did it. So take that skill that you have, take that value that you have, and trade with it. Exchange it. I tell people the, the origin of money is trade by butter. Once upon a time, there was no money. There was value. I like his wristwatch. He likes my shoe. We exchange. Problem started when I liked his wristwatch. He didn't like my shoe. But he liked your shoe. So I exchange your shoe not because I want to wear your shoe, but because I want to use your shoe to collect his wristwatch. Problem started when I exchanged your shoe and then go to him and he said, I'm no longer interested. Then I now have no shoes. I have ladies' shoes and no wristwatch. <laughs> and because the world was getting very complicated, we said, wait, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. There needs to be a unit of value. So let's use gold. Let's use cash. That's how cash came. So if you're going to ever get wealth or access to money, you need to learn how to trade. I don't say I'm not a trader. You need to learn how to have value and trade with the value you have. What the Bible analyzes here is what every country and every economy needs to do to ever move forward. They need to find the resource that they have. The first thing they will need to do is sell it. Before they begin to add value to it. Yeah, sell it. Yeah. <laughs> Before they begin to add value to it. I don't know if this time I'm looking at in front of me is telling me the time I have left for half time. For half time. Ah. <laughs> I'm like, hey, really, is it? Am I supposed to be divided by two? <laughs> okay, great. So, every country, every community, every person, first of all, identifies the value that they have and they're able to sell it. Something very interesting happened a few years ago. One man in Congo went to the farm. On a normal day's work, one hour's job, 
And while he was working on the farm, he found a piece of shiny white glass. He brought it out from the farm and displayed it amongst the things he had done on the farm, yam, and a few other things he had planted. And one white man walked across, saw this shiny piece of white glass, and said to the, to the African Congolese farmer, how much is that? I like that. How much is it? And the guy said, well, it took me one hour of hard work in the, in the bushes to find it. Uh, my, my hourly rate is this amount, but for, because I think this is precious, give me a good amount. And the guy says, I'm willing to pay $300. And the guy was beside himself. And then this man took the same shiny piece of white glass to London, took it to elaborate it for them to check it up, cleaned it up, polished it up, put it on display, and sold it for $11 million. Are we together? They both had a resource. Are we together? One did not know what he was selling. The other understood what he had. Same piece of glass. The Congolese farmer is back to the farm. Looking to find other things. The guy who got the white piece of diamond is free to, he's free from work. Are we together? Yeah, he's free from work. If you have $11 million and you're not free from work, something is wrong with you. <laughs> because it's very simple. You can just come to Abuja, build 12 houses, name one of them, name the first one January, name the second one February, <laughs> name the third one March, and put tenant there and tell them this is when you pay me. January. <laughs> Tell them, pay me on January. Your name is January. I don't want to know your name, please. You are in January. And then you collect your money. As, and then you are free. So, and if, you are, if it's a good house in a good location, $11 million, come on. You can get $5 million after, after, per month. So what will you be doing? You'll be preaching the gospel. Did I hear you? <laughs> you will teach everybody you meet along this way of life. Say, I, don't know, I want to show you a way of life. You don't do things like this. Yeah. You know, so you need to learn how to trade the value. You need to like to discover, understand the value you have and then polish the value you have. You understand? So I have... My friends tell me I talk a lot. Eh? That's talent. I have learned how to talk properly. That's a, it's becoming a skill. I go together. I know how to sing. I have a good voice. That's a talent. I have been able to harness and I have learned how to sing, present, lead people to worship. It's becoming a skill. Develop skills out of what you have. And then once you understand this, once your angles or your paradigm changes to realize, one, I'm a steward. Two, I have resource. Three, I have what I have based on my ability. Then the attitude you need to operate with in life is ask yourself, how do I increase my ability and how do I demonstrate faithfulness with what I've already been given? You know, there's a very interesting story in the Bible where some of the disciples of Jesus Christ came to meet him and lamented about a building that collapsed. Remember that story? Remember? Lamented about the building that collapsed. I think it's in Luke 13 or so. Yeah? And Jesus Christ wasn't a very nice person here. Sometimes they paint Jesus Christ in a very different picture from who he really is. I like to read the Bible because the Bible shows you the, all the signs are complete. Yeah? So they came to Jesus Christ and said, 13, Luke 13. It says they were present at the season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So there are some Galileans who Pilate mingled their blood with sacrifices. And Jesus said to, and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than other Galileans because they suffer such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Does that sound like Jesus Christ that you know? They came to tell him and some people died. Say, ah, you, you will die. <laughs> Don't go and change your ways. So they mean good, they blood with sacrifice. Okay, continue. <laughs> he says, you will likewise perish. Of those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He then spoke to them a parable. 
to let them understand what he was talking about. And he said, it's a very simple parable. A farm owner had land and planted fig trees. And then after two years, or three years, after three years, he came to check the fig trees for fruits. And he did what? He found none. And he said, I gave this fig tree land. I caused it to rain. And this fig tree is producing no results. I know what the master said. Cut it down. Why let it waste space? It means God has given you resources. He has showered you with opportunities. He has blessed you by creating and giving you an opportunity to be in a fantastic environment like Lighthouse where you hear God's word regularly undiluted. But God is looking at your life and checking for results. He's saying it's three years. What's up? And he says, you know what? Cut it down. And that's where Jesus Christ showed up. Jesus Christ showed up and said, but the answer I said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. You know, many of us don't look at our lives as if there are expectations. Oh, the master will come. The resource is already in your hand. There's talent already. He's giving you five. He's giving some two. He's giving some one. And what is expected of you as a steward is that you be found faithful. Faithful to what you have been given to make the most of it. Listen, why do I want to be able to be all I want to be, all I can be? Is it because I want to wear two clothes at the same time? No. Is it because I want to drive two cars at the same time? No. These days, God has been bringing me before people who have helped me to realize I cannot afford to be foolish. You don't understand? I met a man who took me to his house. This man has a house that has about 10 bedrooms. 10. He built it about 30 years ago in his glory days. And then I was invited into the meeting to come and see him so that I could help him fund the project of partitioning it into six apartments. You don't understand? The property is in a prime area of town. Solid building. He took me to the highest place. Like the devil took Jesus. <laughs> took me to the highest place in the building and said, you know the quarrel between Olufalaye and so so and so? It was settled here. This spot is where we used to do parties in those days. When you stand here, you can see Lagos. I go together. And then he told me, this area we are in, my wife and I have been living in this building. She has not been here in five years. In the house that they are living. There are some rooms that are shut up. Nobody goes there because by opening all the rooms, you have become house boy and house girl. Because the duty of cleaning it is too much work. You don't understand. So I look at the man and I'm listening. And I'm like, okay. So do I have need of more than a two-bedroom house? Really, really? No. One room where my wife and I will be staying in. And then another room for the guests. If we intend to have any. <laughs> so I realize. Waste. Now he wants to cut it to six. Live inside one. And the rent he can collect from the rest. Minimum rent he can get from the remaining five houses. 25 million per year. Minimum. He cannot sponsor that project. In my mind, I'm thinking, why can't he just sell this house? And then my common sense is telling me, maybe he has, maybe he has used it to borrow money. So it's not really his own. He only wants to be able to generate value from it. It is expected of a steward that he be found faithful. Whatever God has given to you, use it well. Bring it to his highest value. Let God look at you and say, eh, hey, correct victory. Let me transplant you to another space so I can occupy more ground. The reason why I want to be all that God has made me possible to be is not because of me. 
No. The opportunity cost of wealth in the hand of a sinner is the havoc it can cost. Are we together? If it comes into my hand, there's plenty of goods that we can do with it. There are people that once God prospers them, there's problem in University of Abuja. Are we together? <laughs> well, God can trust you. Are we together? So why don't you have it? Because the little you have, be faithful. I've seen the red alert for long. I want to pause at this junction and allow us to answer, ask questions. Um, I, I, if I'm not careful, I'll continue. But let me pause. And let me allow us to answer questions. I ask questions so that we can answer them. I believe there are questions on your heart. I want to do this. I want to do that. What about this? What about that? If I don't know the answer, I will say I don't know the answer. Are we together? There's no crime in not knowing the answer. Uh-huh. So I'll say I don't know the answer. I will pray that God will answer you when you sleep tonight. <laughs> but if I know the answer, I will assist as much as I can. So I don't know how we're going to do it. If you have a question you want to ask, we call it mentorship, yeah? yeah. So I need to be able to interact a bit. Yeah. The mentorship session I run in Lagos, we do it for three weeks. We see so that it's building up, it's building up. I like process. It's building up, it's building up, it's building up. And then, but most important thing is access. God's spirit is here. You know, we can, we can leverage, we can learn. So I have a question here. Yeah. Um, you spoke about taking risk accountability and taking risk. I want to know, um, knowing, knowing the fact that uh, the, everything that, that is given to you that it, you're supposed to be accountable for yes. and you must not spend lavishly, you must not invest wrongly. Now, I want to know the difference. Where, when, can I, when can I take risk knowing the fact that I must not invest that same money wrongly? Because if you, you also spoke about you need to know you need to learn how to take risk taking risk ability mm. so if i have a hundred thousand error and i have a project and here are business ideas that i have in my mind now <laughs> how do i know which one to put that money so i don't lose that valuable money <laughs> at the end of the day it looks as if i'm foolish putting that money in the wrong okay business. i like i like your question very good question how do I balance taking risks with not losing money? Okay, good. Now, I did not ask you not to lose money. You, you will lose money. Let's, let's be practical. If I share the testimony of my loss with you, But I learned something. I learned something from my pastor. He always makes fun of me. He said, Dilo, I don't have money like you. Because it takes someone that has money to lose this amount of money. He says, I have learned to ensure that if interest does not come, capital must return. And he understands the principle by which he wires his transactions to ensure that that is done. Okay? But before you fully understand how that operates, you will lose some money. Remember what I read to you. It says it's criminal to live cautiously like that. There are people who never do anything that the only thing holding them back in life is this fear of failure. Are we together? The fear of failure is stronger than failure itself. Stronger. I tell you a story. There's this very interesting story of a man, a king, who was approached by death. And death told him, I just said, I should come and tell you, I'm coming to your village. I will kill 25. You must promise not to tell anybody. Say, I promise. Keep it to yourself. Say, yes. When he got home, he was looking sad. His wife approached him. King, why are you looking sad? He said, I'm keeping a secret. I cannot tell anybody. He said, even your wife. Two of us have become one. Share the secret with me. I promise not to tell anybody. He said, it's the spirit of death. I saw him yesterday. He said, he will kill 25. He said, hey! he said, shh, it's a secret. He said, okay. 
She got to work the next day, her best friend said, Why are you looking sad? Say, I'm keeping a secret. <laughs> In a matter of a few days, the entire village was keeping one secret. <laughs> On the set day that death will come, all the villagers were keeping vigil. By the next morning, they did a census of all the deaths. 100 people died. The king was enraged. Charged where death was. Death! You promised me 25. They said, King, I killed 25. I think the rest were killed by my brother. Fear. <laughs> Fear of death is more dangerous than death. Fear of loss is more dangerous than loss. He says it's criminal to live cautiously like that. It means take risks. If you show me somebody who made money every time he did business and never lost, I'd like to know the person so I can learn from him. Because on the year I studied even the richest people in the world, I realized that the year somebody became the richest man in the world is the year he suffered the greatest loss in the world. But how do you take calculated risks? Get guidance. If you are venturing into a business line somebody has done before, ask questions. In the multitude of counsel, there's safety. There's, there's a, you know, sometimes people want to charge for, ah, want, are you the first person to do that kind of business? You're not the first. Say, ah, no, no, I don't want anybody to know it. Ah, I'm sorry for you. You want to learn a lesson that nobody else is going to be able to learn as well. <laughs> Experience. <laughs> Experience is a very expensive teacher. So you can learn from other people's experiences. But there are people who want to learn by their own experience. That's the problem. So take the risk. You will lose. You will lose some. You will lose before you make. Somebody analyzed and said, he realized that, yeah, that, you know, it was like a, wow, I found it. The MD of one of the biggest companies some years back, his son, he said, I suddenly realized that in order to double my success rate, I must be willing to double my failure rate. Because the more I fail, the more I will succeed. The more I try, the more I fail. The more I fail, the more I will succeed. And then with guidance, with God's help, with inspiration, your errors can reduce. I have made less mistakes this year than I have made last year. Put together. Because now, there's some transactions. I'm like, I don't agree with this transaction. Say, no, no, it's okay. No problem. Bring your collateral. The collateral is 200 million. The business is 50 million. No problem. Let the business fail. We will sell your 200 million dollar property. Do you understand? So capital has gone. Interest has gone. But capital is already locked down. I'm dealing with more. Let's check what you had. You know, let's ensure that we are safe. We are not taking the risk with you. You are this one. This risk is yours. We are only assisting you to do it. Those kind of things. So, if you want, you, and on a small scale, you lose. You will learn. What you need to do is every time you lose, make sure you learn. Because to lose and not learn, that's double tragedy. But when you lose and you know that what you have lost is school fees, he has given you another degree. Yeah. And it's good. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, someone there. Good evening. Good evening. My question is, what do you do when you can do so many things and you find it difficult to um, just Choose. focus on one and see it through to the end? So you just find yourself turning in different directions and so many projects, 50, 40, 60 percent, not 100 percent. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to our challenge challenge of the multi-talented. So God gave you five talents now. It's a problem. <laughs> the one he gave one talent. Problem. Now, what you do is this. What you do is start with one. Now, I'll, I have that challenge. I had that challenge as well. Until I realized I'm just dissipating energy. I'm doing this one, I'm doing this one, I'm doing this one, I'm doing this one. 
today, I can show you a straight line behind everything else I'm doing. I'm pushing only one truck. That truck is pushing the other trucks. Are we together? Because ordinarily, otherwise you will dissipate your energy. There's a principle I learned some years back about how to grow a priced grape. If you want to grow a grape that can compete in the marketplace, and you can put side by side and say, I want to win a competition of the juiciest grape. What you do is, when you plant the grape and it begins to fruit, it comes out with about 32 branches of grapes. Allow them to grow for a while. Then divide it to 16, destroy the rest. Allow the 16 to grow to for a while, divide it into 8, destroy the rest. All the juices that shall have gone into the 8 will channel into this new 8. When it grows and it's looking beautiful, take away 4. Are we together? When it's growing further and it's now 4, take away 2. The last 2 will tempt you to keep to the end. Ah! I have finally found the 2 key strengths. Cut it to 1. All the juice that will have flown in the different directions will flow into that one. So, you need to, first of all, identify one. Essentially, pour your energies into it. As in today, for a long time, I asked myself, because I asked myself, nothing God gave me is going to waste. Everything is useful. So, I asked myself, okay, I know how to draw. Why do I know how to draw? Where does drawing come into the equation of my life at this time? But, the more I pour my energy into what I'm doing, the more I realize why. Because if I want to explain something to you, every time I take my pencil to explain something to you, I must draw something. And because I'm drawing something, you're like, ah, okay. So, and those drawings, you'll be thinking, maybe I've been thinking like it before. I'll draw, okay, this, enters into this, enters into this. When I was doing technical drawing, I will get A's in technical drawing. Is How come you can see the third dimension? Which third dimension? What are you talking about? I can't see the, how can you draw something like this? I need to have three sides and it's be on one sheet of paper. Do you understand? That everything 3D, everything becomes useful once you find a place. Everything has its use. Everything will find its, will find its use. Now, I, I, you see people who you may think, okay, I can draw, I can paint, I love fashion, I love this, I love that. And then you start with one. And I'll give you an example. If you have an iPhone here, iPhone, iPod, iThings is an expression of an artist who went into technology. You understand? Probably will have done very well with fashion. Probably will have done very well in let it look nice. Let it, let, let it be sharp. And then he takes that energy into technology and he must to, still look nice. And then it's appealing to a broader spectrum of people because he has taken all the energies and put it in one direction. Do you understand? So, same thing you want to do. You want to say, what can I do? How can I bring it to bear in what I'm doing? And once that grows, it can now begin to branch off. But when you want to begin to branch off before you even have a vine, they have a problem. Is, is it clear? Is a you know, what do I do? Is it as in my love for mathematics will make me wonder why will I end up with somebody who has nothing to do with engineering? But well, everything makes sense. I can add Naira and cover very well. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Final question, and then I stop. Yes, ma'am. Finally, my brethren. <laughs> and the power of his mind. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Um, thank you for all the points you've been sharing since. Please, my question is still on the RICS assessment. Is there like a standard checklist for someone that wants to leave a job? You know, you are not getting all you want from your job. You know you have more potential, but you want to leave and you still want to be okay after you've left the job. <laughs> you know? So is there like a standard checklist then, like a particular period of time you could give yourself before you leave the job finally? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The question is before you leave your job. Now, I will attempt to answer it. When you leave here, just go online to Google and type Academy plus before you leave your job. Because I think I wrote about that like five years ago. Before you leave your job. And some of the times when I was writing those things, I was encouraging myself. <laughs> so it was deep revelation in the height of where you need it. 
Do you know that in the last one week, I've had that question in different forms from the other side of where you're talking from. From people who left their jobs, who came back to ask me, Dear Olu, I've left my job for a while now. It's not working. And I have another job offer now. Should I take it? And my answer was, Take it! For as long as you're asking, should you take it? Take it! On the day you're not meant to take it, you will not ask that question. You will just not take it. <laughs> but if you are still asking, ah, my children's school fees are not paid, my house rent is due, and now I have an opportunity, they are offering me seven million, should I take it? So I will be the one you'll be pointing at. Say, he said I should not take it. <laughs> Do you want to move into my house? <laughs> <laughs> take it first. Uh-huh. Because you're asking me, should you take it? It means you want to take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. When you need to leave it, you will know. But when do I know when I should leave? What's the standard checklist? I tell people, a job is not a bad thing. The Bible says, he that is faithful in little will get more. The Bible says, if you are not faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you your own? That even when all you have is not yours. When you know, when you really don't understand that even when you have all you have is still not yours. That you need to deal with it faithfully. A good time to leave is when you know by revelation that you need to leave. That's very important. When you know, it doesn't matter. It's not whether it is raining, it's not whether it is paying me, it's not whether it's not paying me. I just know that it has, been, it has been revealed to me like Abraham, go to the place I will show you. You will not need to worry about, I want to be okay after. I tell people, it is not if you will suffer, it is when you will suffer. It will not be, a, there will be storms. It's not, there will be times when you will be shaking. One man told me, he said, Diolu, I worked for 20 years. I became head of my career, HR, this, this, this. And I pl- unplugged to do entrepreneurship. And because what I'm selling is water, I get to drive a bus. And then I was driving my bus one day, and one of my former colleagues saw me. And I felt embarrassed. And he says to me, so how do I transit into this business without experiencing this suffering? Ah. If you like, take a job and come back in 10 years. The amount of years you have accrued as an employee will not convert into time as an entrepreneur. So, make up your mind. Do I want to bear my yoke in my youth? Or do I want to bear it with white hair and wisdom? <laughs> so, it will, it will, it will, their faces will pass through. You need to ask yourself, when do I want to go through this journey? And then, a good time to leave will be I have built sufficient I've lived my life I've not lived my life at the lifestyle I'm capable of because in the times when I become an entrepreneur I better learn to live another lifestyle or I should have kept it constant before then and then I have something that can take me on until it breaks through 55% of businesses start with the savings of the person who starts the business. 10% starts with money from the family. 7% starts with internal partners. I was shocked to realize that in doing business, the highest amount of money you will get does not come from bank loan and outside. It comes from personal savings and inside the house. So a good time to live will be when you have built sufficient savings to be able to start what you want to start as well. But the ultimate is just knowing. Knowing in your heart. When I left my first job, what I heard in my spirit, God told me, whatever job you is offered to you that is the riskiest, that's the one you should take. I had two opportunities. One was a risk. On the day of my interview, my boss-to-be was smoking. The other boss, Christian, follower of God, he told me, do you do anything you want? I will do it for you. I need you in this place. First company. Second company, the guy was telling me, you need to make up your mind. If you are not coming, don't come. 
you know, you know that they interviewed you when they had not employed me. My the people that employed me interviewed you before I came. I'm there now. All the other people I've worked with them before. You're the only person I've not worked with before. God told me, go for the one that is riskiest. So I knew that that was my that was the one I was going for. So I went there. We we'll go for parties. We we'll go for what we call we we'll go for all night meetings in my boss's house. And then he says, Diolu, aren't you going to drink anything? And there's nothing in there. There's nothing on the menu I can drink. <laughs> they began at my above my level. So, ah. You open the fridge and yes, ah, ah. Do you understand? Now, I, I stayed there. And then after a while, I heard, leave. Into a place I will show you. Okay, so I told my boss, I want to go and start my own company. And the guy smiled and said, Do you look, come and see me? And I went to see him. He said, Where are you going? Where exactly are you going? Have you got another job? I said, No. I've not got another job. But I've got another office. I've paid for rent. <laughs> you know, and, I'm, and I plan to go and start there. And he said, That's very courageous. That's very good. That's good. I admire my courage. That maybe, you know, I should have said a few things. I left. And I left. I suffered. I was together. I was, I had months when 10% of my normal salary did not come in. I was together. I got to a place in my life where I said, ah, ah. In fact, I was using wisdom. This entrepreneurship, I was using wisdom. What was the wisdom? Every project I do as an entrepreneur, I update my CV. This CV can still be used for one day. After a while, I decided to apply for a job. I was together. I was called for an interview. In the middle of the interview, they said, Do you know how much do you want? Ah! How much do I want? I asked for how much I wanted. I said, Tell me what you want, Julio. We'll give you what you want. I went to meet one of my mentors. I said, This entrepreneurship is not working. Out. I, I think I want to go back. What do you think? He said, did you take anybody's permission before you left? <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I feel I'll be like a sellout. It's as if I'm sold out. I'm sorry for you. You cannot eat. You're thinking of selling out. But I'm not going to take the job. He said, don't you know my own story? I left. And after a while, I came back to the same company. <laughs> Then very, we spoke till 2 a.m. at night. I went to his house. Then very early the next morning, I just, in my sleep, and my wake, I had, a, I had a debate. It was a war in my mind. I woke up in the morning, I told him, I said, sir, I've thought about it. I'm not taking any job. Let me die here. He now said to me, can you imagine? He said both sides to me. He now said to me, good, very good. Now you're ready. I said, yes, yes. He said, yes. whenever you ask me how his work, what do I tell you? I said, whenever I ask you how his work, you tell me, you have not found another one. He's doing his own business. You tell me, he has not found another one. He said, why do you think I've not found another one? Do you think I'm looking? Those two days, I wrote two different articles. You can check on my site. I wrote, you have a choice. That was the first night. Second night, I wrote another one. Give yourself no other choice. <laughs> that even though you have a choice, give yourself no other choice. So, it's when you're ready to do that, that you're ready to go. And then eventually, things picked up, things happened. And, you know, things continue to happen. So the checklist is there are a few things you can look at, have your savings, have your that, but no. No, that is time. And it's better to rough it out earlier than later. Because later, it's difficult to rough it out. It's better, it doesn't, as in, they look at you. They don't expect much. 
There are many places you can go to and they will still look at you as if, okay, you're a student. But once you begin to have pot belly, They will not look at you like a student anymore. They say, ah, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Let us pray. Talk to God and lift your hands up to him. Tell him that you are a steward of his resources. Thank him for all that he has given to you. Thank him for all he has made available to you. Thank him for everything he has done for you. Bless his name. And receive grace. Receive grace to identify the abilities he has deposited in you. Receive grace to recognize the resources you have available to you and to grow those abilities. The Bible says he's able to make all grace abound towards us that we, after having sufficiency in all things, shall abound in every good work. Ask him to help you to identify what you have, to give you the grace to labor, to develop the de- abilities that are already available within you to develop. And pray that it won't be about you. It will be about the world around you that God wants to touch. It will be about the world around you that God wants to train. It will be about the people you are meant to disciple. It will be about the world you are meant to reach. That God will lift you up and elevate you and use you as a connecting point to connect man back To God through Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus name. Father Lord we thank you for tonight. We thank you because the reason why. You brought your word into our lives. Is because you want to transform us. Father Lord we open ourselves up to you tonight. We ask that these words will not leave us the same. In Jesus name. Father Lord the grace to understand. That there is nothing that we have that we have not received we receive of you in Jesus' name. Have all of the insight to realize that there's nobody left without a resource. That there's something you have given each and every one of us. The grace to be able to locate it and to polish it, we receive of you in Jesus' name. Paul declared, by God's grace, I labored more than they all. Let your grace that allows us to be able to labor fervently, to build value out of the things you have placed in our lives, be available to us tonight in the name of Jesus. Have a Lord, we receive the grace to grow in ability. We receive the grace to grow in grace in the name of Jesus. Thank you because in the days to come and the weeks to come, you will demonstrate with our lives the good things that are declared in your word in Jesus' name. Our world will not remain the same. The people we will come into contact with, we will train, we will help to disciple, we will bring them to your kingdom in the name of Jesus. Have a Lord, you will not just bless us as people that are blessed and are by themselves. You will continue your work of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation through each and every one of us. Our words will bear you witness, our lives will bear you witness in the name of Jesus. Thank you, living Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.